if I got rid of this, this, and this, this isn't, you know, high priority stuff. I'd have plenty of time to get a workout in or to make a healthy meal or to sleep a little bit more. So and a great thing just to build on that, Brian, because that's such a fantastic point. The language we use to ourselves and the dialogue that we use is important. And the one word phrase that can support people is switching the language that I don't have time to I can't prioritize that. That one shift makes you realize that you actually do have the time, but you're not prioritizing it, which is fine. I actually have no problem if someone decides, you know what, I can't prioritize my health. I would argue that you should. It will spill over into other areas of your life in a positive way. But at least you're not fooling yourself. And I think for everybody listening as a call to action, as one way to have a massive positive benefit in your life without actually having to do anything too much is change that language from I don't have time to I can't prioritize that and start to see that shift. Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. Are you ready to level up your fitness routine? If so, you're in luck because today I have Brian Keen onto the show and we're going to be discussing a more effective approach to a fitness routine other than just working out. So when it comes to an effective fitness routine, you have to take into account nutrition, stress management, and sleep. And those are some of the stuff that we'll be discussing today. What's up, everyone? I'm Brian Carroll, and I'm here to help people move more, eat well, and be adventurous. And this was a really fun episode with Brian because he is also a podcaster. He's had over 370 episodes. So we got into a really nice rhythm and routine chatting with each other all about fitness and how to change the way that you perceive stress and how to really enhance your body to be able to better adapt to what life throws at us. And all of that encompasses a better overall health and wellness approach for our systems. So Brian, over the last seven years, has gone from working full time as a school teacher to being one of Ireland's and the UK's leading thought leaders on all things health, fitness and nutrition. He is also the author of two bestsellers, The Fitness Mindset and Rewire Your Mindset. And he also has some really neat accomplishments when it comes to different fitness achievements as well, such as competing in different endurance races, ultras, etc. in really tough environments. So like the Sahara Desert, for example. This was a really fun one. So let's dive into my conversation with Brian. Thank you, Brian, for coming on to the show. Brian, I'm really looking forward to chatting. It's, I've been going through a couple of your episodes on the podcast and we got to chat a little bit before we went on air. So I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, and if anyone gets confused, uh, the one with the accent is Brian with an I. The one without the accent is Brian with a Y. So <laughs> we'll just clarify that right here from the beginning. But Brian, I know that you do a lot of different fitness type of stuff, a lot of different exercise, um, some stuff like fitness modeling, endurance, training, all that type of stuff. So can you give us a little bit of your history and background and what is one of your most memorable fitness achievements? So... To go through my backstory, I've got kind of a little bit of a different area to most fitness people when it comes to how I kind of got into the fitness industry. So I used to be an elementary school teacher. So before I was doing any fitness modeling, before I was competing in bodybuilding, before I was doing endurance events, before I was doing any social media or writing books, I was a teacher. So for four years, I worked as an elementary school teacher. And to be honest, Brian had no real aspirations to leave it, apart from the fact that teaching felt like a job to me, that it was okay. It wasn't that I loved it, but I also didn't hate it. And when one of the jobs I went into, thankfully, I got very lucky with this in hindsight, when I was teaching a, what was a year three, so a third grade class in London in the UK. I'm from Ireland in the west of Ireland, but I was teaching in London in the UK. After coming back from California, I worked over there with um, Berkeley University teaching soccer, moved back then and worked full time as a primary school teacher. And I went into a job that I felt very unprepared for, and I hated it. I absolutely couldn't believe that I'd spent all this time, energy, money, focus, studying to become a teacher, and this was going to be the next 40 years of my life. And I had a real pity party for myself. I remember telling my mum who is the closest person to me, how much I hated what I was doing. And she asked me something, a question that I've put to so many people since. 
And she asked, what would you do for free? And I'd never thought about that question ever. My version of what success looked like was that you went to college, you got a good safe and quote unquote safe and secure job. And you know, you got married, had 2.3 kids and retired and you die. Like subconsciously, that's what I thought success looked like. And she said, what would you do for free? And I thought I would work in a gym for free. I was like, I love working out. I love training. I love being in that environment. And she said, okay, why don't you go and try and do that? So for the next two years, I went and got all my certifications for fitness instructor, personal training, strength and conditioning. And I worked as a teacher during the day and I worked as a personal trainer in a gym at nighttime. And every time I got paid for half an hour or an hour of personal training in the gym, I couldn't believe people were paying me for it. And it got to the point where I felt I had to make this jump and had to try and make it work full time. So I moved out of London, moved back home to the west of Ireland basically starting from zero, you know, what I call my ladder being up against the right wall. With teaching, I felt like I had spent years climbing a ladder, got to the top and realized I was up against the wrong wall. And with personal training and fitness, it felt like my ladder was against the right wall. And one of the ways that I tried to establish myself as a trainer was these fitness modeling competitions. So they were getting quite popular around 2014. And I struggled for brand recognition. I had no social media. I had no podcast. I'd written no books. There was nothing like that. But I thought these shows might give me a jumping off point for people to get to know who I was and I'd get more clients as a result. And and it worked. It 100% did. I went and did very well in those shows. I got a pro card my first year of competing, which basically just means you can compete for money for anyone unfamiliar with the world. And it's just competitive bodybuilding. If you think of it, you're, you're going in, you're stepping on stage and then you're traveling around doing photo shoots and getting paid for things like that. And a couple of years of doing that, I transitioned my business online and my daughter was born in 2015. And that was my kind of wake up call away from the world of bodybuilding and fitness modeling. It was very all consuming for me at the time because you were dieting and extremely in a very extreme calorically deficit state. So you were just walking around like a zombie. Well, I was walking around like a zombie half the time. And my daughter was born and I was struggling to even pay attention to what she was doing because I was just so tired all the time. So I left bodybuilding, fitness modeling and transitioned my business online. And over the space of several years, I transitioned into writing books. My first book, The Fitness Mindset, was an international bestseller. It's been 16 weeks on the Amazon bestseller list. I did, that book did better than I ever dreamed, like beyond my big dreams of how well it did. And then I wrote a couple more, Rewire Your Mindset, two years later, my most recent one, The Keen Edge, Mastering the Mindset for Real Lasting Fat Loss, came out in January of this year. Again, hit the Irish bestseller list as well. And I moved out and started documenting more of my journey online. So my biggest fitness achievement, to pull it back to your original question, is a combination between two things. In 2018, I ran, well, I use the term loosely, I hobbled and moved a race (laughs) in the Sahara Desert called Marathon de Saab, which for anyone unfamiliar with that world is six back-to-back marathons through the Sahara Desert in Morocco, self-sufficient. So you carry all your food on your back, you carry everything on your back and you you do six marathons back-to-back. When I say run, as I said, after day one, after a single marathon, my legs were completely gone. So it was more of a shuffle and a, and a, and a, a hobble for the next five marathons for over the next five days. And that partly was one of my biggest achievements because I'm not built and have never been built like a runner and I'm not a great runner. I have a bodybuilding background. I was a sports person before that. I played Gaelic football, which is like a combination between NFL and NBA basketball and football in the states and so I'm, I'm quite a big build i'm five foot eight 85 kilos which i'm not sure what the equivalent is in pounds but you know i'm built like a hobbit i'm not built to run you know and so i struggled so much with running for that event and then a year later i wanted to set myself another challenge so i ran 230 kilometers over five days through the arctic and that was completely soul destroying for a completely different reason 86 kilometers from the end of that race i tore my achilles and every step your achilles for anyone unfamiliar is is at the back of your heel 
and every step for 86 kilometers felt like someone was shooting me with a cattle prod and i i finished it you know it was probably my biggest physical achievement because i couldn't move for like it was it put me out of training for six months when i came home but i finished it and i got to the end i crossed the arctic circle line in 2019 in february 2019 so those two were probably my two biggest fitness achievements for different reasons one with marathon to sob it felt like i had blown all those self-limiting beliefs out of the water because i wasn't sure i was going to be able to do it until i finished it and the arctic changed my relationship with pain it made me realize that we are so much stronger than we think we are mentally physically emotionally that if we can just get our head right and get our mindset right we can do incredible things and i came back with a completely different relationship to pain that i could push my body push my mind push my emotional state through things that I never thought possible. Like one of the things, Brian, I was always afraid of was I've been very fortunate. Both of my parents are still alive and obviously my daughter's alive and well and happy and my partner. But I was always afraid of what would happen when my mom died. And I was always afraid of what might happen when someone close to me died. And would I be strong enough to not break when that happened? And when the Arctic came, it made me think about how strong I am. And Jordan Peterson, the psychologist says, you know, be the strongest person at your parents' funeral. And that experience taught me that, that I can be an oak tree in a storm and I can survive and I can push through these things. And my message online generally to people now is you're a lot stronger than you think that yes, you don't have to run through the Arctic or run through the Sahara or any of these crazy things, but there's something in your life that is uncomfortable for you to do that if you consistently did, you would get mentally tougher and more mentally resilient and you could push through things because you're a lot stronger than you give yourself credit for so that's a a long-winded way of my background and my greatest fitness achievement so far how long was the recovery for the achilles about six months um but i have to clarify i probably could have recovered in three months but i pushed tried to get back training and i re-injured it and it put me out for about six months so i couldn't run i could train so i was able to do like i was walking around with a big chest and arms and shoulders because that's all i could do (laughs) so like every day was arm day um but uh for six months it put me out i wasn't able to run and, and i was about a year before i was able to run quite comfortably now i don't know if you're similar to me in this but uh, living in Washington, I'm very used to uh, um, mild summers, so mild weather in the summers. And then in the winter time, it's usually cold and rainy. And so when it comes to hot temperatures, I struggle massively. So did you experience that when you did your um, the the ultra down there in the Sahara? It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I'm similar because Ireland has very similar similar climate to Washington in terms of lots of rain. It doesn't get that hot. It doesn't get that cold. But I did a lot of work in the sauna to prepare for the Sahara. So I was doing 40, 50 minute sessions in the sauna, just acclimatizing my body to the heat. Now, I got some great benefits off the back of that. Like I started to look into things like, you know, BDNF, brain drive, nootropic factor that comes from the heat shock proteins, et cetera, from exposing yourself to heat. So I got these massive mental health benefits off the back of unintentionally training for the Sahara. So it's something that I still have in my routine. But no, the Sahara, with the exception of maybe one period of about 10 miles where it felt very, very hot, it, I didn't find it too bad it, because there's a breeze, weirdly enough, in the Sahara. Now, the Arctic was colder than I imagined. So it, it, to play contrast on that, the Sahara wasn't as hot as I thought it was going to be. I thought I was really going to struggle with that coming from Ireland over to an environment that I was very unfamiliar with, but it was fine. It never, it didn't really play a role. Other things were an issue, you know, the uh, s- snow s- or sandstorms. And, you know, I lost the use of my left eye on the first day because sand went into it. And I just, you can't fix it. So yeah. I was effectively like for the whole evening and night pouring water into my eye, trying to get the sand out. Now it was fine by the second day. So they were kind of unexpected things that you couldn't control with 
these sort of events and challenges, and I know there's a lot of people listening to this podcast who are kind of career driven, you do things at the weekend, challenges, climbs, races, whatever it is, but there's certain things you can control, controlling the controllables, and that's important to do, but there is also an element of just things can get thrown in your direction that you're not going to be prepared for. So I was prepared for the heat. I wasn't prepared for some of the other things in contrast with the Arctic, which, as is, as I said, was considerably colder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> now, I have to ask, um, as someone who really appreciates the uh, movement capabilities of the human body, when you were a teacher... Did it bother seeing you seeing all these kids kind of stuck in a chair or at a desk for a, such long periods of time without movement? My kids were spoilt because they never missed physical education, PE, or anything that was active. So I think I have a bias because I would do a lot of lessons and classes that required them to move because I was I was that boy like I hated primary school and elementary school as a kid because I had really bad ADHD I just couldn't sit still and that made me quite a good teacher particularly with boy heavy classes because I know what it felt like so I would get them up and I would get them moving and I would do coordination games in between lessons so they would have you know, games where they would be catching a small ball with a single hand and one behind their back. And I would be doing coordination games with them where they'd be getting up and moving in between lessons and in between classes. One, I thought it was better for the overall, everything that I read. I was at the time doing um, a master's in, in pedagogy. So I was learning about learning styles. And I, I, thought that this was something that would help with the retention of information that we were doing. So I, there was method to the madness as well. But no, it, I hate it. I hate the traditional setup. It was part of one of the reasons why I left teaching. But my kids always got active. They always, we didn't miss PE. So, but I think that was more bias off me based on my background and what I was into. Yeah, yeah, that's good to hear. I know um, where I'm at. Uh, for a period of time there, they were trying to uh, start reducing and even getting rid of PE classes and other stuff to add in more uh, STEM type of classes, which is a total bummer because, mm -hmm. I mean, being third graders or just elementary school in general, you got to move. You can't just sit there and learn about technology all day long. Could not good. Couldn't agree more. Could not agree more with you, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Now, with your approach to uh, fitness, it's a lot more than just, you know, exercising and adding in a training program. Uh, you have a lot of other components to it. So what are kind of the main components that you utilize to improve someone's fitness level? I think a big misconception in the fitness industry in general is isolating parts and nutrition and training, although a huge component of a fitness regimen are just that there are components of an overall regimen and when we think of fitness most people will think of food and they'll think of nutrition and that is important and they'll think of training they'll think of movement moving and that is important but you also have to look at your recovery you have to look at your sleep quality you have to look at your mindset in general and your ability to manage your stress levels all of these things contribute to whatever goal it is you're trying to hit losing fat building muscle getting fitter, getting healthier, improving vitality. You have to look at it as a whole. And I think when we break it into the component parts, we do a disservice as personal trainers, as nutritionists, as professionals in the space by not tying it all together in people's lives. And some people will get a be bigger bang from their book fixing their sleep than they will looking at their nutrition. By all means, look at it all. But if you're someone who struggles with sleep, and you have really bad food cravings, those two things can be are heavily connected if you're looking at the scientific research. So you look at your sleep quality, you focus on that, you regulate those hormones, ghrelin, leptin, hunger, satiation hormones that become down-regulated with lack of sleep, which struggle, which makes people struggle with dietary adherence and sticking to a nutritional plan. And you look at the mindset, managing stress is huge. If you're in a career, in a job, where you're working to deadlines and you're working to targets, you need to have a stress management technique, whatever that looks like. This falls on different examples. In my last book, I talk about the, the active versus the passive methods and the extreme versus the non-extreme. So extreme versions of, of stress would be acute stressors like short bursts of exercise, 
exposure to cold, exposure to heat, all of those short acute stressors help you deal with chronic stress or chronic cortisol um, elevation of stress hormone, all the way down to, you know, meditation apps or journaling or just having somebody that you can talk to, to. That all helps reduce stress. So I think when you look at it as a whole, you end up getting better results. And that's something in terms of conversations like this and on my platforms that I try and bring a little bit more awareness to. Yeah, from my understanding with Europe, you have a lot better uh, stress management practices built into the workforce. Like over here in the U.S., you're lucky to get two weeks of vacation time a year. And I think a lot of European countries, they start at like five weeks or something like that. Um, so definitely over here in the States, a lot of people are stuck in this rat race of having to work all the time. And then they don't really get that downtime to relax and de-stress. So for people in those type of situations where it's really hard to break free of that work model um, and it's really hard to uh, relax in any way, what can people do simple things to reduce stress in other ways? It's a great question, Brian. And I think it comes back to and ties in unintentionally to the ultras we talked about earlier about controlling the controllables. When you're in the US, and I lived in the US, that imbalance is all, is going to be there for the foreseeable future. And complaining about it and giving out about it, for it, it's very easy to do. I di I've done it myself when I've been in those positions where I'm like, oh, having a pity party for myself. But we can't control it and we can't change it. But we can change how we see it and we can choose to put in stress management techniques that support us knowing that we're not going to get five weeks in the US for the most part unless you're in a very luxurious position where your company or your job offers that. But what you can do is look at things that will manage your stress day to day. So two that I've mentioned that are ba basic bedrocks outside of the tactics of, you know, heat, cold, training, journaling, meditation is your nutrition and your sleep. Now, I never want to be to the man with the hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. So as a nutritionist, as someone who specializes in this, I never want to be like nutrition fixes everything. But nutrition does play a big role in how you feel. And if you're eating poor quality food. And when I say poor food choices, I'm talking too many low nutrient foods. Something I've tried to change the conversation around, particularly with people I work with, is separating food into good and bad categories. I don't necessarily think that's a great idea either. Either, either. Food has no morals. You know, a piece of broccoli is not going to save you from a burning building and, you know, a chocolate bar is not going to stab you down a back alley. Like there's no good or bad food. It has no morals. But there are low nutrient foods and there are low calorie foods and there's high nutrient foods and there's high calorie foods and there's a combination of everything in between. But if you can eat mostly nutrient foods, nutrient dense foods, lots of plants, complete, assuming you're not following a plant-based diet, complete protein sources, healthy fats, complex carbohydrates, and that's 80% of your nutrition. And then you've got your 20% with the foods that you love, chocolate, cookies, beer, wine, whatever it is, you're going to do quite well when it comes to output, your energy levels, you'll feel better. And as, a and as a result, you'll have a reduction in stress. And what that will do is it will support and enhance your sleep quality generally. So if you're not consuming too much sugar, if you're not consuming too much caffeine or stimulants, you're probably going to enhance your level of sleep quality. And as a result of that, it will come back to what I said earlier. You have those regulation of those hormones that keep you satiated, that tell you and keep you full when you're feeling full. Those hormones, ghrelin and leptin in particular, those two get downregulated with poor sleep. So it makes it very difficult to stick to any nutritional strategy because you're hungry all the time because your leptin's downregulated and your or your ghrelin's down downregulated and your your satiation, you're not feeling satiated when you do eat because of your ghrelin being downregulated. You can balance those off. So look at your nutrition, look at your sleep, look at your exercise. A, an area that you'll know, Brian, that hopefully a lot of people listening will know based off the great content you're putting out on the podcast training is a stressor, but it's an acute stressor. It's a short-term stressor that can be really beneficial to managing long-term stress. But also, if you're someone who loves working out and training, you will need to understand that it's stress and cortisol in particular is cumulative, which means that it doesn't necessarily matter where it's coming from. It all adds up. So if you're really stressed at work and then you go and start smashing workouts five, six, seven days a week, you're going to get 
that negative impact. That's, you know, central nervous system fatigue, that excess of cortisol where you're feeling sick all the time or your sex drive is low or you're fatigued and lethargic and walking around feeling tired all the time. So you, you need to get the balance right. And that balance, and I hate saying this as someone that would love to say do X and you get Y, that balance is subjective to the person based on how you're eating, how you're sleeping, how stressed you are currently and what you can handle. So what I'd say is a best practice is look at your food, nutrient dense choices as much as possible, that 80-20 rule, look at your sleep quality, getting good quality sleep, seven, eight, nine hours every night, whatever you need, it's, it's individual to the person and then look at your training load. Do you need three workouts a week? Do you need four workouts a week, five workouts a week? Where's your sweet spot for where you feel less stressed and you feel your best and then it's just a rinse and repeat after that. What is a more effective 80-20 model? Would it be 80-20 every single day or 80-20 week by week? So for instance, like a week by week situation, if you eat healthy or really well uh, Monday through Friday and then you just eat all your beer and chocolate and all that stuff Saturday and Sunday, is that less beneficial than having that dripped in a little bit um, every single day? Well, taking away the metabolic function, the physiological function, I would approach that from a behavioral standpoint and what works better for the individual. What you can stick to and sustain over time is always going to be the best approach. So if you're somebody that has that nearly all or nothing Monday to Friday, but I like to relax at the weekend, then 80-20 for you is probably going to look like that, where you're a lot more regimented with your food choices Monday to Friday, and then you enjoy your weekends. You take, I do it in programs, I call it a flexible weekend approach. That works great for some people, where there's others who are much better with the moderation approach, where they have 80% of their daily nutrition was really good, and then they have their you know, a couple of glasses of wine or a couple of beers or their chocolate bars or cookies at nighttime. And they do that every single day. And it's just, it's very much down to personality type on what connects with you. The funny thing about that, I talk about this in the last book. I've got two made up characters. One is um, Carol, Carol, Carol Cold Turkey and Mary Moderation, where you tend to have people that will fall on two sides of the coin, where they, the thought of going the entire week and wait until the weekend to have their beer and have their cookies. They're like, oh my God, I couldn't do that. I need something every day. But there's other people who are like, no, no, I can't do it that way. I would prefer to be super strict Monday to Friday and then have leniency at the weekend. And the people who are on one side tend to not be able to see how the other people do it. It's so funny because I always meet the Carol Cole turkeys and the Mary moderations and then they can't figure out how the other person does it their way. But the answer is it depends on what works best for you. So based on your personality type, you'll probably connect with one mess, one tactic more than the other. So my suggestion would be that that's the route you go. Are there any specific warning signs that can uh, let you know if your stress level is getting too high? Like, do people become snappier? Do they become um, uh, hangry? Do they start snacking more? Do they start gaining weight? Any of those type of things? That's a belter of a question because what happens with a lot of people, Brian, is they confuse too much stress in, in the fitness world, it's under training versus or overtraining versus under recovery. I get asked that question at least once a week where people are like, am I overtraining? And my answer for 95% of people is no, you're under recovering. And overtraining is if an endurance athlete, somebody who's doing five, six, seven hours a day, six, seven days a week. Yeah, they're going to be overtraining. But the majority of people are under recovering. And those who are training four or five days a week, with stressful lives can get the symptoms of what's overtraining. It's basically just too much stress. It actually doesn't matter where it comes from, whether it's from training. As I said, stress is cumulative. So it doesn't matter whether you get it from too much training or a combination of uh, issues at home mixed with stress, work stressors mixed with too much training. It all adds up. It's cortisol to your body at the end of the day in terms of the amount that builds up in the system. And what can happen with those is there's yellow flags before there's red flags. Red flag of too much stress looks like complete full-blown burnout where you feel like you've been hit by a bus every single morning and you have no get up and go. Like you're, 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 you're not depressed because you don't feel mentally off, but you have the symptoms of that physically. You just, you have to pull yourself out of bed. Thankfully, 
there's yellow flags before that. And I know there's a lot of high achievers listening to this podcast. And it's very important, particularly as someone who identifies as a type A personality. I have that default, go, 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 go. So I run the risk of burnout and I run the risk of that as much as anybody because that's my default personality type. But looking for those yellow flags because you can override them. Some ones that come up and they come up in different shapes and forms for people. One is low sex drive. So sex drive, just no interest in it. You probably can do it, male or female, but you don't really want it. That's that's one sign. Another is your uh, hunger levels. Either, this is so paradoxical, but either you keep eating and can't get full or you have no appetite at all. That It tends to show up in one of those two sides, the, 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 depending on how somebody, uh, how stress and cortisol affects them. So you'll see that. The third thing is the immune function. You're getting sick all the time. So you're picking up every cold that's going and you've got the flu multiple times a year. So what you'll generally see is you'll you'll find it in those systems. You'll start to have those 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 breakdown in the in the systems and the physiology and the hormonal system, sex drive, immune function, etc. So you're looking for those yellow flags, and it's not a day to day thing. It's not that you wake up today and you're like, oh, I'm not really in the mood. You know, I'm not really in the mood for sex. Females, this is more so because that goes up and down based on the menstrual cycle. But I'm talking 28 days out of 30 where you don't want to. Or you're sick for 15 out of 30 days of the month and you're, that happens three months in a row. Or you are 28 days where you just keep eating and can't get full. Or 28 of 30 days where you're just, you're not hungry. You're eating because you know you have to. They're yellow signals. They're yellow flags that cortisol and stress is too high. And if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to burn out and you need to put a plan in place around it. I like that. Do you ever use um, other data, like from watches or anything like that? Personally, no. And I have a very love-hate relationship with fitness watches, p- particularly. Like, I love, I've got a Garmin, and I love it for uh, tracking my rest periods, for swims, things along those lines. Big fan. But when it comes to things like, particularly calories burnt and sleep quality, they're very inaccurate as of now. Like, they're slightly better then randomly throwing darts against a dartboard and picking a number, but just a, just just slightly. So until that technology catches up, and it will, I'm sure it will, but for now, at the time of this recording, April 2022, they're not crazily accurate. So I generally don't use them for that. Yeah, I'm always curious about that because you hear about like the aura rings and all that stuff. I also have a Garmin watch and I use it for a lot of uh, different activities, especially in the mountains. But a lot of the other data is just kind of I look at it, but I don't put a whole lot of faith in it because I know there's a lot of room for error. Yep. But it's kind of interesting to see. And hopefully in the future, you know, all that information will get better and more accurate. I think it will. I think it's a matter of time. I I put a section in the last book because I try and make my books evergreen, meaning that that you could read it in 10 years and it will make as much sense then as it does now. But I have a caveat in the section on fitness watches. And I put, this is the only part of the book that if you're reading it at the time of writing, this is inaccurate, these sources of trackers. But in the next few years, I reckon they will be considerably more accurate. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, one thing that a lot of people struggle with is getting good restful sleep. And I know there's a lot of uh, factors nutrition, stress, all that type of stuff that can impact sleep. But what are some other um, uh, things that people tend to do that limits their sleep that they probably shouldn't do, such as, you know, like sitting on their phones and watching YouTube videos right before bed? That's something that I do. And I know that interrupts my sleep. So are there other things like that that people should do less of if they want high quality sleep? I'm curious, and I will answer that directly, Brian, but... uh... Do you know why that impacts your sleep in a negative way? Uh, because it makes me stay up later because I fall down the YouTube rabbit hole and I go from <laughs> video to video and to video and then I'm like, I just lost an hour and a half. Cool. Uh, that's okay. So that's one. <laughs> the there's actually a, but then also the blue screen. Yeah. And all that stuff there's, too. there's also the physiological aspect, which is I think slightly misunderstood because melatonin is a is it is 
the hormone that'll help you fall asleep to keep it very simple like if you think of cortisol and melatonin they're kind of opposite sides of a spectrum cortisol is your stress hormone it's what wakes you up in the morning melatonin's on the opposite side and it's it tends to go up as the day goes on and as the sun goes down and it helps you feel sleepy that gets blocked out when you're on a blue screen or on a screen with blue lights so your phone etc so like a blue light blocking app or blue light blocking glasses can can help that quite a lot but what i'd say with sleep and i'm a notoriously poor sleeper somebody that spent years reading books researching interviewing some of the leading experts in the world that i could get my hands on for my podcast for sleep all to get my own sleep dialed in and the biggest thing was having a routine. So having a sleep routine that you stick to 99 out of 100 times. And I went through a phase, I still get up pretty early, I got up about 6 a.m., but I went through a phase of getting up the 5 a.m. club for a couple of years, particularly when I was doing longer training sessions for races, etc., because I wanted to be up before the rest of my family and have it done before anyone else was up. And I would have that set get up time every day, which actually is straight straightforward. You set an alarm and you get up. But going to bed, as you've mentioned, when you go down the YouTube rabbit hole, amongst other things that can pull your attention, is actually very hard. And having a set bedtime, something that I have a seven near my daughter's nearly seven, having a seven year old shows me how important it is for her quality of life to have a set bedtime. And as soon as we become adults, we remove that. You know, it's one of those things that when I was seven or eight, I was like, I can't wait. Like, eat it, as many sweets as I want and go to bed as late as I want. You know, and now in my 30s, I'm like, sweets make me feel sick if I have too many and I need a, a bedtime to have a good night's sleep. So it comes full circle or half circle, whatever you want to label it. But having a routine. Now, another thing to focus on is individual sleep requirements vary greatly person to person. They're not always stagnant and stable. And some people need seven hours, some people need eight, and some people need nine hours plus. And that varies depending on what you've been doing generally during the day and how your life is at the minute. So if you're training quite intensely, your sleep requirements are probably going to go up. And you can listen to your body with that. But contrary to that, Somebody who's not that active, although most of the people listening to this podcast are, but during periods of your life when you're not that active, you might find that actually you don't need eight hours. You're fine on seven or you're fine on seven and a half. And that extra is actually making you groggier. It's making you feel more tired when you wake up. So people have this eight hour rule in their head. And yes, that's a good best practice and target to aim for. But your requirements might fall shorter than that or below that and they might fall higher than that so you need to experiment with it and the last thing when it comes to sleep and this is i'm probably biased here on my own experience experience based on somebody that is a self-proclaimed overthinker and like can struggle with anxiety and just thoughts rushing through my head i think it's a very typical type a thing journaling and getting all the thoughts in my head out before i put my head in a pillow the simplest and most effective thing that I would have said, no chance, journaling. I'm like, give me a drug, like give me some melatonin or give me like a sleeping tablet. Th- that would have been 10 years ago, my go-to. I'm like, give me something stronger. I'm not going to journal. Like that's not going to help, but it does. It just, that cathartic release of getting all the tasks out of my head. I'll normally write down everything I have to do the following day before I go to bed and then any other thoughts that are racing through my head. And as a result, it helps me sleep better. Now, that one's a bit more personal to me. There are other things that people can potentially experiment with, but they're ones that I tend to find have a very good return on investment for not a lot of money, time, or energy. So... uh you do everything right. You journal, you set your bedtime, your wake-up time, you're very consistent. Your little kid comes in at midnight, interrupts your sleep, and they do that, you know, three, four times a week. What can you do for that? <laughs> it's an interesting one. I've been very fortunate with my circumstance. Now, I have an incredibly supportive network around me. So, thankfully, I've never experienced that firsthand. But... I have worked with a lot of parents, mums, dads, who have had that happen. What I tend to recommend to them, 
and this isn't to send them in a completely different direction, but for those who have a temporary issue with sleep, because what, it's temporary. If you have a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, they're not going to be that age forever. They're eventually going to be 12, 13, 14, and the last thing you want to do is come into your room. So firstly, realize this thing will end. This is not going to be consistent for the next 40 Perfect. years, hopefully. But there's a book I read, and I had him on my podcast. His name is Nick Littlehills. He used to be Cristiano Ronaldo's sleep coach who plays professional football. And he came on, he wrote a book about sleep, the myth of eight hours. And it's effectively breaking down 90 minute REM cycles and using strategic napping for times in your life when you're struggling to get consistent sleep together. And for someone who has that 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning where your kid is coming in for whatever reason, or there's something else going on where there's just broken sleep, strategically napping for 90 minute periods where you can carve out that time can be a useful tool to minimize the negative effects of poor sleep quality. So I would recommend people check out his content, check out his book and check out that tactic and strategy. That's something I used when Holly was really young because it, it helped me a lot with sleepless nights, etc., and my work schedule. And when I used to compete, it was something I used because I struggled with sleep for similar reasons, just based on the time in my life. And I found it really useful. So I'd, I'd recommend people maybe check that out and consider that. What's the optimal way to wake up? Do you uh, let your body wake yourself up? Do you use an alarm clock? Do you use some sort of artificial sunrise type of situation to help you wake up? Are you asking what I recommend or what I do? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Okay, so I, I have to clarify this because this is definitely the part of the conversation where don't do as I do, probably maybe consider do what I say because everything else I've talked about are all things that I do and apply. I know based on research and based on my studies that the best way to wake up is, is naturally. It's going to be mimicking something that's daylight based and letting your body wake up naturally. I still don't do that. At some point in my life, I might, but for now I don't. I set an alarm and I set one alarm now because I was very bad. I was the, 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 the eight alarmer. Like I would sleep just so that I could press snooze seven times which is the worst thing you can do for your body. Like if you think of it just from a basic standpoint of stress in your body, you're getting cortisol spike to wake up and then snooze. Another cortisol spike to wake up, snooze. And you're doing that seven or eight times. Like you're literally, you've set yourself on this cortisol stress roller coaster before six o'clock or quarter past six in the morning. <laughs> like it's a disaster in terms of how to start your day. I did that for years when I was teaching. And now I set one alarm and I literally roll straight out of bed and I just get up. Now, it still takes me, Brian, about 40 minutes before I'm fully with it. Like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a morning person by nature. Like, I'd be a lot more of a natural night owl. And I tend to fight against my own chronotype there just because of a family commitments, training commitments, work commitments. So I tend to re It took me a long time to get to the point where I was able to get up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. just because it's so against my natural instinct as someone that would go to bed a lot later if I was left to my own devices but it serves my life in other ways like I would prefer to have my training done so that I can play with my daughter or meet my partner if she's got a break at work or you know meet my mum for coffee I have priorities that for me are more important than sleep as much as I said as it is important to me and I do focus on the quality I have other priorities that are higher on that value ladder for me at the minute so I tend to do that what I recommend in an ideal scenario is that you go to bed, you wake up when you feel rested and you wake up when you feel recovered and you do it the way your hunter gatherers were supposed to 10,000 years ago. That's probably the ideal setup. But again, I don't know how many listen to this podcast have that luxury or would choose to do so if they could. I know it's something I'm not willing to do now, but that's probably what I'd recommend. Yep. Yeah. When we're out backpacking, the second the sun goes down, we're asleep and the second the sun rises, we wake up with it. So I think hunter gatherers back in the day, they probably did that throughout the year. So summer times, their sleep cycles were probably a lot less. Mm -hmm. And then winter times, they were a lot more. Yeah. They were downregulated at that point. But, you know, with artificial light and everything else and uh, commitments and everything, it's really hard to follow the actual circadian rhythm of the sun, unfortunately. It is. It'd be kind of fun to try for a year. It would be amazing to try. I don't know how I would do that, though. I, it would be a cool experiment. Let me know if you do that. Cause, but it's just that it comes at such a cost in modern life that 
as much as I love the ancestral wisdom and listening to our bodies in terms of what we were biologically designed to do, you also kind of have to make it fit and adapt to, you know, 2022 and beyond. <laughs> yeah, because wintertime, you have like six hours of being up and then <laughs> 18 hours of sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds nice. Don't get me wrong. I'd, I'd be all for that. Yeah, a it bear does, hibernation it does, it does. style. <laughs> Well, let's uh, pull all of, all of this together. Um, how do you apply all of this into your daily routine and what does your daily routine look like? My daily routine is quite similar week to week for the most part. I tend to block off most things that don't align with whatever goals I've set for myself in different areas. So like I break my life into four quadrants. So I speak about this in my second book, We Are Your Mindset. So health, wealth, love and fulfillment. So that's my four quadrant that I break my life into. My health, my physical health, mental wealth, wealth, my bank account, um, my love, my relationships and my fulfillment. So my work, effectively what I do. So my daily routine stays quite similar, trying to fill all those cups up regularly. So I wake up, about 6 a.m., 5 a.m. sometimes if I am have an extra long training session, if I'm training for a race, and I'll train in the morning. I train first thing, empty stomach, I work out, and then I normally do some heat work after, so normally sauna. So that kind of sets up my day when it comes to I've done my workout before 8 a.m. I've been in the sauna, got a little bit of that BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, get my brain switched on, and then I do my creative work in the morning. So normally when I'm writing, so I'm in the process now of writing what will be my next book for uh, it'll be out next year or the year after so i'll write for blocks in the morning or i'll record podcasts where i'll do my creative work and then i normally spend the middle part of the day is off so it's either you know meeting my partner if she's off doing something with my daughter if she's around meeting my mum for coffee meeting a best friend it's a block of time during the day where i'm actually not that creative i struggle with that 12 to 4 p.m window where tasks that would normally take me 20 minutes could take me an hour. So I tend to focus my attention elsewhere on the relationship part of my life. Just again, I'm fortunate with the way I have it set up in terms of everyone being around me. So I do that. And then from four to six or seven, I'll do another batch of either creative work when it comes to podcasts or client check-ins or program check-ins, etc. And I'll switch off normally from 6 to 8 or 9 p.m. is off time. So it's either watching a movie, you know, with someone close or family stuff or recovery where I'm just doing some vibration therapy or foam rolling or whatever it is if I'm particularly tight. And then I try to get to bed by, you know, 10 o'clock. So I have that eight-hour window where I'm trying to be asleep by around 10 p.m. and I'm up for 6 p.m. or 6 p.m., 6 a.m. That'd be a great sleep. There's our hibernation for winter um, <laughs> for 6 a.m. And I, and I rinse and repeat that for the most part Monday to Friday and then weekends are just their family time like it's priority for family you know I've got a, a weekly daddy daughter day where I, it's just me and my daughter that's our thing so we'll go swimming or we'll go to the movies or we'll do something together and that's what I tend to focus my attention on it took me a while to get to that point that like I'm in my mid-30s now and I've been doing this for quite a while and I know not everybody listening has the control of their day like that but what I'd say is you need to carve out windows of time to focus on your highest values and priorities whether that's your physical health or fitness or whether that's your family whether it's a combination whether it's a side hustle or something else carving out those times will make you feel better about everything it is you're doing so my although it might not be that helpful for people because not everybody can replicate it or might not even want to replicate it that's what my day tends to look like week to week yeah whenever people say they don't have time um to work on their health. I'm always, I want them to just sit down and write down everything that they do in a single day, including I looked at Facebook, but mm -hmm. for 10 minutes here and here and here and here, that type of stuff so that they can visually see it and go, you know, if I got rid of this, this and this, this isn't, you know, high priority stuff. I'd have plenty of time to get a workout in or to make a healthy meal or to sleep a little bit more. Um, so yeah, uh, you can, there's always ways to prioritize health. You just have to, you know, make a little sacrifice, look at what's taking up other parts of your time and then making those changes. And a great thing just to build on that, Brian, because that's such a fantastic point. 
the language we use to ourselves and the dialogue that we use is important. And the one word phrase that can support people is switching the language that I don't have time to I can't prioritize that. That one shift makes you realize that you actually do have the time but you're not prioritizing it, which is fine. I actually have no problem if someone decides, you know what, I can't prioritize my health. I would argue that you should. It will spill over into other areas of your life in a positive way. But at least you're not fooling yourself. And I think for everybody listening as a call to action, as one way to have a massive positive benefit in your life without actually having to do anything too much is change that language from I don't have time to I can't prioritize that and start to see that shift. That's pretty powerful too, because it's, it's, it would be very tough to tell someone I can't prioritize my health because <laughs> everyone will look at you and go, really, <laughs> one of the most important things of living is your health. And you're saying that that's not a priority, huh? Yeah. And you're willing to admit that. It, Interesting. There's a, I had a Robin Sharma on my podcast who wrote the monk who sold his Ferrari and a multitude of other great books. And he's got a great line that if you don't prioritize your health, you're going to have to prioritize illness. And I love that. It's, and it's so true. That's fantastic. It's so true. And I think it's, it works as a wake up call for a lot of people if they have that mindset. Yep. Yeah, that's a fantastic quote. I'm going to have to remember that. Well, Brian, is there any final things you want to make sure we uh, touch on before we fully wrap up here? Uh, no, I've had a blast on this, Brian. Like, I really, really enjoy some great questions on here. I know you're doing fantastic work with the Summit for Wellness podcast. So, mate, keep doing what you're doing. And thank you so much again for having me on. Of course. And people can find you at briankeenfitness.com. You're on Instagram. Uh, you have a YouTube channel. You got your podcast with 370 plus episodes. So especially podcasters listening to this, you know, jump on over, look up Brian's uh, podcast right in your podcast app of choice, and you can listen to a bunch of his episodes as well. So thank you, Brian, for coming on. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks again, Brian. I hope you were able to take away some different ways to really enhance and up-level your fitness routines, and especially when it comes down to the sleep and the stress components there. I know a lot of people have a really hard time getting adequate sleep at night, and a lot of people are very high-stressed, high-strung as well. So take some of this information that we shared and be able to apply it to your own life, and you should see some pretty neat changes happening in your own body. If you want to learn more about Brian, head on over to briankeenfitness.com. He's also on Instagram, and he has his podcast as well. So if you already have your podcast app opened up, just look for the Brian Keen Fitness Podcast, and you'll find him right there. Okay, in the next episode, I have Spencer Feldman on the show. Let's go learn who he is and what we'll be talking about. Hey, Spencer, what is one unique thing about you that most people don't know? Uh, okay, so I was um, a mid forceps delivery, which means I was coming in feet first and got pulled out with forceps and my head was crushed. And as a result, I ended up with no oxytocin, which a lot of you know, keep, uh, kids with birth trauma get, um, which low, meant I never really developed emotional intelligence. You know, So I was... Um, very socially awkward for a long time. Uh, and then I realized that oxytocin was the reason for that because I never got an oxytocin hit from a normal birth. So I started taking oxytocin. And I think I have the distinction of having taken more oxytocin than anyone in human history um, in a nasal spray. Hang on, I keep some by my desk. And... <sighs> anyway, so um, yes, I think I could be in the Guinness Book of World Records for that. And uh, that was definitely um, a transformative experience to have the emotional centers of my brain mature finally, but so late in my life, and then to be able to go back and, be, and understand in retrospect you know, why my life played out the way it did based on the fact that I just didn't understand. I didn't have the, the brain development uh, for those social centers. I didn't even know you could get oxytocin in a... a nasal spray like that can you overdo it uh yes and no um if i overdo it i'll i can maybe get a little nauseous or get a bit of a headache the main thing is now i don't notice much from it like the first six months i took it it was um each time i took it was incredibly blissful um physically and um emotionally and now it's just kind of pleasant and that's because um i've initialized my own oxytocin production and receptors. Uh, so uh, oxytocin is the only thing I know of that won't downregulate, meaning um, the more you take, 
um, it'll get you to the point where you have optimal oxytocin and then hold you there, as opposed to, for instance, if someone were to take serotonin uh, and they take too much, then they're going to downregulate serotonin production and endogenously and serotonin receptors. And then when they stop, they go into depression or other things. So oxytocin is not like that, which is very nice. Fascinating. Well, what will we be learning about in our interview together? So I would like to give you the kind of clinical pearls on 20 plus years of uh, formulating detox products based on what seems to work in what's going on with the toxins we've been exposed to, the things that you can do that work, the pitfalls to avoid, um, lessons learned. And what are your favorite foods or nutrients that you think everyone should get more of in their diet? Oh boy, that everyone should get more of. I don't know that I would say that there's something everyone should get. Um, you know, if you compare our f diet to that of primitive man, uh, we are getting seven times less fiber than they do. And that tends to shift um, us from a bacterioides to a firmiscutes um, bacterial component in our gut. And when that leads to all sorts of things like obesity and such. Um, but I think it's a very individual thing. I think, you know, you have to know your own genetics. Um, I would say as a general rule, you want more diversity, um, in your diet. Um, so for instance, you know, I have a greenhouse and I grow, um, lettuces and basil and, uh, endive and boy, it tastes so much more intense and delicious. And when it's, you pull it right out of your, you know, hydroponic bucket and then you chop it up and then you eat it. So, you know, uh, I would say that's more the, more the variety of the foods you eat, um, the freshness of the foods you eat, avoiding foods that you're allergic to, so you don't end up with a high immunoglobulin ratio and dumping your albumin, crashing your albumin down. Um, and, uh, you know, understanding that there's some things that we are not really not supposed to eat, like, you know, things with enormous amounts of, um, uh, nutrient um, blocking agents. So there are some plants that, you know, don't want to be eaten and they make it very clear. So, um, you know, soy definitely doesn't want to be eaten. There's all sorts of things, ways it'll screw you up between the thyroid and mineral inhibitors and protein issues. So, um, and then you've got things like spices that don't want to be eaten, but aren't so intense that um, they'll kill you. So you can actually use them medicinally, right? So Oregano doesn't want to be eaten, so it, it makes the oil, the, uh, the oregano oil. But at low levels, not only is it tasty, but um, it kills fungus. And rosemary doesn't want to be eaten, which makes you know, rosemarinic acid. But you can use that to preserve your food. So, you know, the whole food topic is a, a very deep one. And I would say, you know, go take a look at the work of um, Price Pottinger Foundation and Nourishing Traditions and things like that. What are your top three health tips for anyone who wants to improve their overall wellness? Okay. Um, you need to be sleeping well. Um, and then how you do that. You need to improve your gut biome and uh, fast once a year, a water fast. It was a great conversation with Spencer. It was basically like having a master class on detoxification on this show. So make sure you tune in to the next episode when it goes live. And until then, keep climbing to the peak of your health.